So this is right up my alley, and I love it. And so this is that time of year when you are really antsy to be in your garden. Everything is just about ready to bloom. My daffy is just so close. My sarcococa has bloomed. The, the things are coming up. Peonies are pe 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 poking up. Not hops, it's just yet. But I think all the native, all the woodland flowers sometimes are coming up. It's just a wonderful time. And the nurseries are beginning to be full of stuff. So you want to be out there planting. So the first thing I did was measure my soil. This is a, a compost thermometer. And the reason, the reason I like it is it has such a long probe. And so what you do, you just want to know, my soil right now on the north side is 50 degrees. So 50 degrees is kind of the, the threshold for things to start waking up, for the soil microbes to start waking up. Everything's just starting to wake up in your garden. So I put it down to where the roots are, and then I can tell if the things are ready to go. However, this has been a year, a weird year. Um, and they say we might, we might have snow today or tomorrow. But it's unbelievable. So it's probably a little bit too early, especially to work in your garden, to till your garden, because it's still too wet. You need to be able to squeeze a clump of cake, uh, so I'm a plate. You need to be able to squeeze a clump of soil and not have any water come out. And then your soil is probably ready to work. I have a list here of the last frost day 10% chance. So if you live in Beaverton, it's May 5th. Uh, Newburgh's April 28th. Portland Airport, April 21st. Portland Downtown, March 13th. Troutdale, April 23rd. Wilsonville, May 8th. So this is a combination of times over years. So you can tell we're still in kind of uh, frost territory. It's way too early for tomatoes, maybe way too early. Even if they're in the nursery, that doesn't mean that they're exactly ready to, to go into your garden. Maybe you could buy them just because they're precious and you want them. And you can put them in your garage or put them underneath the eaves so that you can uh, look at them. So, <laughs> I know, it's so hard. <laughs> so let's get going. So it's the best of times, just like we talked about. And it's still the worst of times. Uh, however, like I told my slug in the snail class, I've seen my first slugs and I've killed my first snail. So they're out and about. So and now is the time to uh, bait. And um, time to get your tools in order, time to think about what you want to plant, maybe work on your landscape list. Figure out where your sun is, where your shade is, and clean up. I just finished my winter cleanup, and I'm feeling quite proud. So is, this is the time to get all the annuals that you haven't cleaned up, all the, the ornamental grasses that are straw colored. Clean those up. They're ready to go. If, they, if you have annuals or that have self-sown, and you're happy where they are, cool. If they self-sown to where they shouldn't have been, like the middle of your yard, now is the time to pull them out. Clean up any branches, any pruning, any stems that have fallen. It's just a general cleanup time. And I use this time. Now that my soil is 50 degrees and my garden is ready, but things still have all my herbaceous stuff hasn't come out yet, that's when I put down my garden mulch. And the, the timing of garden mulch, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, is when your soil is warm enough to produce light. If you put it on when it's too cold, it acts like insulation, and your, and your ground will stay cooler. It'll eventually warm up, but there's no point right now in keeping your garden any colder or cooler than it already is. So weeding. I already have bitter crest. Yay! And it just looks like one of my favorite flowers, Corydalis, which is a beautiful uh, little woodland flowers. They look exactly the same, and the bitter crest comes right up through it. And dandelions are getting ready to, they're feeling pretty perky right now. So it's so much easier to pull when the soil is soft. And you can recognize that they're uh, weeds sometimes. That's why I like to do my own weeding, because I know which one's a weed and which one a precious plant that I pay much money for. So to plant or transplant, now is a good time when the, before the plants have really started putting on new growth to dig them up, cut them, and then replant them. And if you can, if it's the soil is right, so that you can dig a hole without damaging the soil, now's a good time to do it. 
So when I started in uh, Master Gardeners at, way back when, the common way to pull or to plant a uh, plant is to dig a hole twice as wide and twice as deep. Remember that? Okay. Not anymore. <laughs> Science has changed. You still dig twice as deep because you want the roots to spread out. But you only go as deep as the root ball. <coughs> what am I saying? Twice as deep. <laughs> See, I'm just, actually, I'm just seeing if you're listening. Very good, very good. You want to go twice as wide and only as deep as the root ball. And that way the roots will spread out. Then you set the, so this is wrong. This used to be a good picture for me, and it's wrong. So I keep it because it is wrong. And let's see how nice and wide that hole is. The other thing is you don't want to backfill with compost or amendments. You want to backfill with native soil so the roots go into the native soil. Otherwise, you kind of create a sink, and then the water stays there, and uh, the plant can drown. The hardiness zones. So when I, 1992, we were zone seven, and this means that the plants are able to stand um, the minimum coldness for a sustained amount of time. So zone seven, actually, is that seven B? It should be zero to ten. So we could, a plant, if we're in zone seven, can withstand a winter cold for a sustained amount of time, five to ten, five to ten degrees. Zero to, five, zero to ten. That's pretty low. Over time, though, we're now zone eight, and that means that can, can say the plants can sustain a cold and thrive at warmer temperatures. So it means that our our climate has changed over time, and that you can see it in the plants. What this means is now that now the nurseries are getting plants that have climate changes, even ten and eleven. So that doesn't mean that we can grow them here and then have a winter like this and expect them to last. But they're bringing in more Mediterranean or tropical plants and they're so, so wonderful. But you just, so if you want to, do it and then treat them like, like an animal. Or maybe we'll have that really mild winter that sometimes we get and they will survive. Uh, one of my favorite plants is a butylon, which is a flowering maple a shrub and they have wonderful variegated leaves sometimes, or deep green leaves, but the flowers, um, it's called a flowery maple, but it has no relationship to a maple, but the leaves look like maple, and it really cut like flower in many colors. Mine did not survive this winter, but they have in previous winters, and whether they're in a, in a pot or in the ground. So it's just, besides it's a nursery opportunity, you get to go buy stuff. <laughs> okay, today we're going to talk about ornamental gardening in trees, shrubs, shrubs, and perennials, which is my favorite. So, even if you have some annuals that self sow or perennials, you're going to still have ratty looking stuff right now, like hellebores, epimedium, uh, pulmonaria. I'm going through my garden. Things that just that went, sometimes are, are perennial, excuse me, evergreen. But then going through the winter, they just don't look good. So now I've cut back all my hellebores. So the new growth is what you want. Cut off all the old growth. And the pulmonaries, cut off all the winter damaged stuff. And you have this brand new growth. So your, your garden looks really clean and fresh. The self sowing plants. Uh, that's, I think, Love Lies Bleeding. And this is uh, the Rita Venariensis, which is and so, and it's, when they say self sowing they mean wrap it. <laughs> it. It's a gorgeous plant, it's about five feet, the, the blossoms are right here, and it's happy almost everywhere. So you might get some uh, that your neighbor has, cool, but you all, I can tell when a plant is considered a, a, a rampant self sower is when I see them in the fields. This is dangerous. And there being a venariensis is one too. Something just to be aware of. When you're, because it's often um, in plant lists as th good things to have. If you keep it under control, it is. So pruning. Now is a good time to start pruning. Did any of you attend the advanced pruning classes? She did a very good job. So we're going to go through it uh, from my standpoint, from the ornamental standpoint. 
So an herbaceous perennial. So the ornamentals are divided into evergreen leaves that stay on all year. Deciduous, that means they have a woody top growth, but they lose their leaves. And herbaceous, which means they have a soft top growth, and they lose their leaves. And a lot of glass, the grasses are herbaceous. Um, Shasta daisies. Peonies are, are herbaceous. There are many things. So right now what you want to do is just clean up any of the slushy mess that's left. On herbaceous grasses like Hack and Chloe, Oriola, which is my favorite, it's a yellow grass. And the neat thing about Oriola is it lays in the direction of the sun. So you can create, like if you had a dry stream bed and then you plant on the Oriola over like that, you can get the, the theory that, or the feeling that water's flowing through. But that's herbaceous, and, and I've got that all cleaned up, and that spreads quite nicely. Okay. So ornamental grasses we're going to talk about. So you have to figure out if they're deciduous or evergreen. So I taught um, pruning to landscape crews, and that's hard because they have so much information, and they work in so many different places. What can you tell them? That's basic, that they can take to all these different homeowner associations, all these different clients. So what I tell them is that an evergreen ornamental grass has color throughout the year, whether it's blue, red, uh, bronze, like a leather leaf sedge, or yellow, like an chorus. So you don't touch those. Because if you cut down uh, ornamental evergreen grass, you reduce its vigor. So what you do, the way that you get um, prune and evergreen grass, and I do this on sedges, and blue oak grass. As I take them, uh, hold them, put a bungee cord if, I, if it's too big for my hand, and then just take my clippers and go zoop, 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 and let it fall, fall open. And all that winter damage at the tips is gone. You've got a brand new plant. Another thing that I do with blue oak grass is take my hand, and that doesn't really work very well, or a small rake and just pull it through like you're combing it. And that brings out all the dead stuff. And that works really well on blue fescue. But with blue fescue, if you, if you rake too hard, sometimes you pull up the whole plant, so working with your hand is easier. Or if you have that, that uh, hand tool called the cultivator, that's got three little prongs, you just pull that gently through, and then you'll get a refurbished plant. If it's a deciduous plant, like morning sand, morning light, which is the Discanthus sinensis, which is my most favorite um, deciduous grass, and it gets, so I'm five feet, so it gets about five feet, uh, by four feet, so it's more columnar than round. And then the panicles, or the fluorescents, which are the flowers of the grass, they get up about six feet. And it's really thin green stripe with a white stripe down the middle. And so, and it waves in the sun, it's just gorgeous. And I leave mine up all year because I like the fluorescence and the bird's light. So, but now, right in about February, when you see new growth coming up, it's about an inch, then uh, I take the biggest tool I find, sometimes it's an electric saw, and cut it down as long as I can get it. So if you can't stand that though, if you've got, you have a deciduous grass and it's turned straw, usually in the fall sometimes, then cut it down or cut it into a soft mound. And then you've got kind of ahead of the game by the time summer comes. So evergreens, and right now I'm talking about mainly conifers. Do, does everyone know what a conifer is? I actually had a book working with a client, and I was telling you that this space was perfect for a conifer because it had full sun and it had good drainage. That's key in getting a conifer to grow well. And the one I recommended was, um, it's a false cypress called uh, Blue, Blue Light, something like that. But it's Campus of Paris, Lasolii, and those only get to about eight feet and columnar. So they're perfect for a lands, uh, residential landscape. Anyway, I was going to put one of those in, and it's like an exclamation mark. It nails your garden. It nails that section of the garden. And uh, she's flipping through her book, and I thought, oh, boy, I really hope I know what she's talking about so I can say, tell her yes or no. And she didn't know what conifer meant. And by conifer, I mean anything that has little needles, like for um, leaves. Usually you don't do any pruning on those except for damage. You don't want any crossing branches. You want to take that out any winter damage that's come. You also don't want to uh, fertilize necessarily. If shrubs and um, trees are doing, doing okay, then you don't, and your garden is fine, you mulch off and you have soil amendments, 
They usually don't need to add any food for lives at this time. They've adjusted and they're going to grow well. So trees and shrubs. This thing is important in that you need to know the timing of the bloom. And Sherry went over really well on pruning the fruit trees and some uh, ornamental trees. So for lilacs, for example, which I consider kind of a shrub or tree depending on how it's pruned, they, you prune within three weeks after blooming. If you prune any later, you've already cut off the blooms because they set bloom right after blooming. That bit, you all get that? So if your trees, if your lilac is not blooming, it's because you've pruned at the wrong time, or maybe it needs refurbishing. Usually lilacs are great for the search for six to eight years, and then you start taking out the oldest stems at the very bottom, and that reinvigorates your lilac shrub. And you keep, sometimes you can, then you can keep them from blooming only at the top. So my yellow wine, wine and roses, I'm using this as an example of a deciduous shrub. It blooms on, on buds set the previous year. So this is a great ornamental plant because the more sun it gets, the more burgundy the leaves, and it's got these deep um, pink flowers. It's about a five by five plant. If I say five by five, the first number is always the height, and the second number is always the width. That's one of the few givens in nursery. Though. So I prune this one just to bring it down into shove. I like it this one kind of compact and bushy. And then I get periodic blooming throughout the season. Daphne and Doris are blooming right now. And this is another one that we have a three week window after it starts blooming, stops bloom, blooming so that you can cut it and shape it. Usually they don't need much cut, cutting and shaping unless there's been damage. But if you uh, prune in July, then you lost all the, all the buds. Sometimes you just have to because they're growing out of shape or there's been damage. Something has happened. So they'll recover the following year and they'll get back on the right schedule. So I know hi um, Sherry did this in pruning. So hydrangeas, arborescence, paniculata, and arborescence. And you can tell because they have those long panicles of flowers. They bloom on uh, this year's wood. So you can prune them right now. Mauricii, hydrangea macrophylla, Mauricii. The Mauricii mysteratas bloom on buds set the previous fall. So I had actually pruned this at the wrong time and had no, no blooms the entire year. Now I'm kind of afraid to go touch it at all. No, and uh, Cursifolia really blooms on old wood and it rarely needs pruning. Um, except if you have a bad branch or it's growing cattywampus. It's called Persifolia because the leaves look like oak leaves. And the neat thing about these is that they have this brilliant fall color, just like oak trees. The thing with Persifolias is their normal size is like 10 by 10, 12 by 12, huge, immense. In one client I had, the whole, she had a hedge of Persifolias, I think with strawberries and cream, so it's it's deep pink and then it fades to white. Gorgeous. The head. But you but the bed was twelve to fourteen feet wide and maybe oh, thirty feet long. So it was great. But for normal residential lots they are now developing course of foliage that are five feet to six feet. So I'm testing them out at two because I love the leaf and I love the color. I don't have room, my beds are five feet max or six feet just because of where I live. So I'm going to see. The thing about living in here in Oregon is that we are called the Eden of the Northwest. And everything grows bigger and better. There's a really neat uh, decision shrub called Hot Lips. It's a salvia, a shrub, um, a shrub salvia. And you want to see it, you want to see it up close because it's got white and pink and they look like little tiny lips. They look like sweet peas, kind of. They're, it's a fabulous shrub. It blooms on summer wood, so I just pruned all my back. It's only supposed to be three by three. Mine is only three feet high, eight feet. Eight feet. Wow. So I actually use a saw to keep that in down. Uh, I love the saw. I know it's cruel, but it's it really roses. So now is the time that you start giving your roses the uh, final pruning, starting in February. 
so that you can have the shape and the function you want. You want to prune them to a base shape, you will prune them to an outside bud, and you want to prune them, depending, we're just going to talk more abundance here, uh, to knee height or so, so that you can see them. Housekeeping chores. Actually, I just like this because it's a picture of a shed I've always wanted. <laughs> Order tools and plants, kind of clean up your, your shovels and sharpen your tools. Something that's good now because you can't quite use them yet. Get ready to mow, have your mower sharpened, oil, whatever you do with mowers. Prepare your beds once the soil is ready. Right now it's still too wet in most places with the rain that we've been having. We just, remember when we used to have one week in February that was beautiful? Yeah. And then we would go out and plant and do stuff and then we get creamed again. We haven't had our week yet. Um, start a compost pile. Um, you can do that anytime, but now you can make your own amendments. That's great. Then you bird feeders and insect control. Okay. So lawns, now is a good time to start mowing. The crews just come around and everything, but they're just at the edging and they're beginning the first mowing. And the lawn is looking kind of sad. It probably will look kind of sad for a while, but now might be a good time to add a lawn fertilizer, maybe something strong and nitrogen to get it green again. There are new beds you can get your, if you're going to do a raised bed, you can do that because you're going to import your soil mainly. You want to have a good soil that has strength, but not necessarily potting soil in your beds because the potting soil doesn't have enough structure to hold up the plants for the plant roots. Okay. Compost system. When you make a compost system, you really want to have a mass of three by three by three. That's kind of the minimum mass you can have and get the heat that's needed for the microbes to be active that will eat your, eat your um, the yard debris that goes in. You never want to compost anything that has disease on it or pesticides. Pests. Or that's invasive. Huh? Or that's invasive. Or oh, that's invasive. Good point. Yeah, you don't want to yeah, put down the being from Ariensis or tomatoes. I've had them everywhere. <laughs> Another one is fennel. I love to grow bronze fennel because I love it in flowers and I love the smell of it. And it gets about six to eight feet tall and it self sows everywhere. <laughs> um, birds, you want to clean the uh, bird baths with a weak solution of one, like one quarter cup bleach to two, maybe two gallons of water. And then you can do it periodically so that your birds always stay healthy, clean your bird houses. These are great bird houses made by a former <coughs> master gardener. And, um, but she said they were too hot for the birds, but they look great. <laughs> slugs and snail, oh boy. So like I said, I've seen my first adult slugs out and about in my garden and I've killed my first snail. I know they're about, as soon as the soil reaches the right moisture, which we got, and the right temperature, which is usually about right above 50 degrees, the eggs will start hatching. And the eggs that were um, slugs produce freely. They produce like 500 eggs a year. And so the ones that have withered over from the fall, now they're going to get ready to go, and they're hungry. And they will go, uh, they will decimate. So I, I've already started baiting. Um, so you want to go from least toxic to toxic. Toxic, most toxic is the metaldehyde because it kills everything. It's very efficient, but it will also keep kill your pets. Sluggo is the one I use because it's got iron phosphate, which can which can be used eaten by dogs or birds or fish or invertebrates or beneficial insects and they'll harm them because the iron phosphate is a natural substance in the soil and will disintegrate and go into your soil. Chickens are the best. <laughs> Thank you.